What's going down, man? It's your boy, Donnie Houston. Want to let y'all know about a brand new black-owned firearm company right here out of Texas, right here out of Port Arthur, Solitaire Diamond Cut Firearms. Solitaire Diamond Cut Firearms, man. Listen, they have the best prices. You're not going to find anybody to beat these prices. And they have everything, all your favorite handguns, your favorite shotguns, your favorite rifles, optics, all your accessories. Anything you need that's regarded to firearms sdk firearms got you i'm telling you these are the best prices and you know when you make your order hey man tell them donnie houston sent you and uh you know it may be something else in there for you so sdkfirearms.com man i'm telling you you cannot beat these prices it's black owned it's based right here out of texas right here out of port arthur but you don't have to live in port arthur or texas to order from them they ship from everywhere around the country the customer service is amazing the prices can't be beat the turnaround time is extremely fast. Listen, man, sdkfirearms.com. Go there today and get whatever you need for all your firearm needs, man. Tell them Donnie Houston sent you, and it's going down. You know, I, I, I miss the retail technology killed us, you know. Yeah. But I still have a an inkling to do like an online retail store because I, I got about 50,000 albums in storage. Oh, shit. Most of them have been open. Get I'm the fuck out of here. Yeah. You got any cassettes and stuff like that or just straight albums? I got some cassettes, I have CDs, but mostly vinyl. No shit. Yeah. I'm planning on getting it all curated, I'm looking to get, you know, put some people together, create the investment thing behind it, and uh, so we can get it all curated. So we see what, what I have and the value of it, you know. Because it's, it's a lot of stuff. Like I was telling my, my friend is on tour with Tony, Tony, Tony right now. Oh, yeah. You know, photographer. They, they were just in Chicago. Yeah, they were, they were just here. So yeah. I was telling him I was trying to find vinyl for them to go to the show. But they haven't done any re-releases. So it's like if you don't have original releases from the 90s, then yeah. you ain't got no Tony Tony. Or you find one used, you yeah. know what I'm saying? But, exactly. But yeah. so the value of that shit is... Oh, yeah. And then the 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 independent label. See, when you look at the history of uh, hip-hop, but then in general, black music, all of the record labels were independent. Even going back to the blues, but like Chess Records. Mm -hmm. you know, Chess was an independent label. Uh, when I got in the wait, so they never they never aligned with the with the major to release or no, it didn't have to hmm. see, because everything was independent, like was, the radio station. It was so wide open back yeah, then. And then she went black music. Back in the day, there was no black music on FM radio, and in every city, every black radio station is always to the right of the dial. And in Chicago, see, one of the things that it kind of upset me that they didn't cover on. Uh, Cadillac Records, because that was about chess records. Right, right. And uh, uh, Beyonce portrayed Eddie James. I was Eddie James' driver when I was 18. Come on, man. And so uh, the experience being at chess and knowing what they had done before I got there, but... And it was missing in the they, when I did the film. Well, in 1963, one of the most popular radio stations in Chicago was WCES, which was a black station. They played black music, it wasn't black owned. And uh, it was 1450 on your dial. And the Chess Brothers bought hmm. WCES in 1963. And they changed it to WVON, Voice of the Negro. Huh. <laughs> yeah. And the dial, they, they called it WVON, 1450. You ain't heard nothing yet. That's how they. But the voice of the Negro. That's it, yeah. And it was a, it was the most influential and powerful, only 1,000 watts, but the most influential black station in the country, other than BLS in New York with Frankie Crocker. You know? But then when you, when you trace that history, and just like the 50 years of hip hop, and uh, this summer I was in the company of KRS One and the rest of them, and I got pissed off because I told them, man, how can they celebrate the 50 years of hip hop without including black retail? Because hmm. if it wasn't for the black stores, 
the units wouldn't have moved like that. <coughs> wouldn't move nothing. Hmm. White sellers didn't know what it was. <coughs> I'm going to need some water, too, I think. Yeah. And so uh, all of the record labels were all rap was just totally independent. The majors didn't know what the hell this shit was. I had black executives tell me, George, don't worry about that rap shit. It ain't going to last. Hmm. Black executives. And see, their jobs, it's like I was the only store black that would show up at the Jack the Rapper, the black music convention. Mm -hmm. The only record store, I, would, I was the only, I'd be the only one because we weren't included. It was records and radio. Their job was to get the record played. The corporations, they wouldn't worry about the the black record stores, because we weren't buying direct. We were buying from one stops, sub distributors. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so, uh, but when this, this phenomenon hit, called rap, and uh, I was fortunate, not that I was such a genius, but I was mentored by some greats. The first black distributor of major labels in America was Ernie and George Leaner. Actually, down the street from where I live now. That was at 1831 South Michigan. They mentored me. You, you saw the Black Godfather, yeah. Clarence Savon. Yeah. Them, those are friends. They, they all. I was part of. It wasn't like you went to school, but they allowed you to be around. In that class, you, of, yeah, you yeah. just, yeah, you know, I was just a cool young guy, and then I got a chance to open that store. And uh, so you were just in, you were just in Chicago, just moving around doing your thing and just meeting people. You know. It wasn't intentional. It was the job you had. You know, I always had a job. Hmm. And uh, I graduated high school in 64. Hirsch High School in Chicago. I was going to Luke Junior College. And I was working at Montgomery Ward, mail hmm. order house. And this was during the height of the Vietnam War. And the only way you didn't have to go, your ass was in college. Hmm. And she said, I went, I'm, fuck that army shit. I ain't going to get my ass blown. <laughs> I was like Muhammad Ali. Them be a kind of they never called me, me. No, call me no nigga. <laughs> See, and so uh, I was hanging out this during the fall of '64, and I meet this girl. We start dating and what have you. She had one more year at High Park High School, and she had a part-time job at Chess Records. She was a receptionist and she sang background. Dated for a while, you know, wound up living together a few years after. That was Minnie Ripperton. Minnie Rippleton was your girlfriend? Yeah, when they pictured that, uh, they showed it. It was me, and my father. Isn't it? Let me really put that up there. It might be up here. Oh, yeah. This is, this is my stepmother. That's my dad, me, that's Minnie. <laughs> that had to be 1964, 65 maybe. <laughs> but see, I never, you blew my mind with that shit. Wow. Yeah, when, uh, did you ever see the unsung? Yeah. On Minnie? Yeah. Then you should have saw a little snippet. I was in it. They, uh, that came out so so many years ago. I'm about to go back and watch it again, yeah. but I love Unsung. I never yeah. missed the episode, but I, do, uh, I distinctly husband, remember her. Yeah, her husband called uh, <laughs> Scott Galloway. Scott is one of the guys. I'm, you familiar with him? Yeah. Scott called me because he knew me very well from the Urban Network and all the things I got in L.A. And uh, he said Richard called him and wanted me to be a part of the Unsung. But I never brought up about Mark. Because, like I said, Minnie was pregnant for Mark at the time. And as uh, far as he knew, no, see, that no, was see. his dad. And uh, fast forward, I went, you know, when Minnie died, because we stayed, we stayed friends. Ooh, the, matter of fact, that song, Memory Lane. Yeah. I saw a picture sitting there. We were such a happy, happy pair. Yeah. That's about me and her. <laughs> Yeah. That's my oldest, one of my, my oldest sisters. That's one of her favorite songs of all time. Back down, Marie, Marie yeah. Lang, yeah. That was her, uh, yeah. The many, many laugh. I think it was a 1975, 76, ran into her at a popular club in Chicago. She was visiting 
and uh, you know, like Studio 54 in New mm -hmm. York, mm -hmm. and Chicago was a club called Chasers during the disco era. And I, I was one of the few niggas they would let in there. And uh, sitting there one night, and then many shows up. We laughed, talked with the heavy, we laughed about that song. I said, that's it. What's this memory like? She said, <laughs> she said yeah. <laughs> and now, t today, one of the guys, black guys that bought WVON, him and uh, Wesley South, the news director, uh, it was Purvis Fan, the blues man. They bought the station. That was one of the disc jockeys that they hired years ago. Mm -hmm. He came on at midnight. There were so many disc jockeys on that station. It was amazing. Don Cornelius. The he was on, get the fuck out. First time he got, Don Cornelius used to be an assurance man. He was a Chicago policeman. He pulls over this guy, giving him a ticket. And so when, when he brought him the ticket back, the, the guy said, have you ever thought about being in radio? Because of that voice. Mm -hmm. So he gave him a card. That was Wesley South. Don Cornelius was the first person to interview Dr. King in Chicago. Wow. On WVON. You have to remember, uh, there was no social media. That, there was no such term as that. Yeah. You know, you want to make, a phone, you or you make wouldn't. a phone call, you better have a pocket full of change because hmm. it was all pay phones. You know, see, so it was nothing like, just like stardom. Look, the first group that ever needed bodyguards was the Jackson 5. No shit. Yeah, nobody else. Needed, most, most of us carried their own gun. Hmm. It wasn't what media has created. You know, they take these motherfuckers now and uh, create an image and they ain't got no goddamn talent. And now with the technology, auto tunes and all this other stuff, all they're doing is selling images, you know? And when they start breaking hip hop in strip clubs, that's what changed the game, you know, because Lil' Kim was the first one to come out as a hip hop a half naked. Mm -hmm. And then that was that the became trend. the standard, that, and, and that's yeah, it. Yeah. And the same thing with hip hop because of rap was rap, and they they sampled the classics. It still kept you connected to your family roots. This bullshit now, and the influences on the public, on our children. That's what upsets me the most of all because the the images, you don't know to be a star. The hell with your voice, you got you know, you got to be provocative. Like, yeah, you got to yeah. be provocative mm -hmm. and what have you, because we can work the knobs. And that's it. And when they stop the samples and they come up, well, I got the beats. And you dudes when Earth Wind and Fire and what have you, Earth Wind and Fire started at Chess Records. Because hmm. Maurice White, when I wound up working there, he was Ramsey Lewis's drummer. Get the fuck out. Okay? When you go and you talk about Tony, Tony, Tony and the rest of them. That musician, when we went on the road, like I said, Cadillac Records, when I was with Billy, we looked like the Apollo in New York, the Uptown in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Used to do five or six shows a day. Be six, seven acts on the show. Smoking the Miracles, so and so and so and so, and Billy Stewart. And man, look, I was like, I had run away to the circus. <laughs> but it wasn't like what it would be today, what it is today. We need all these bodyguards and all that. Because they, uh, they manufactured talent. These people didn't earn it. <coughs> They're not making music from what they feel or... Yeah, it's what produce. they think going to sell. And well, I, yeah. you get a producer that could bring out the violins, bring out the horns, and, and they'd be in that room to experience that. It's incredible. And I saw it. Because hmm. <coughs> they was cutting that shit. One, two. Oh, man, the band was the whole thing. If you fuck up, you got to just start over and get yeah, your, get your exactly. shit together. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't no knob to clean this up or nothing. Mm -hmm. But every musician, the violins, and like Chess Records, it's a museum now. And uh, I go up there and remember in that room, and it seems so much smaller now because you get old. Like when I went to Fifth Ward, mm -hmm. Lowndes Avenue, I said, God damn, was this Lowndes Avenue? <laughs> it looked like a side street. <laughs> that was a main thoroughfare hmm. in the Fifth Ward back in the day. Because you took Lowndes Avenue to get to Market Street. Because I had a cousin and David's mom and then L.A.'s mom. They lived in Pleasantville. Hmm. That was the suburb, boy. That was a middle income there. Pleasantville? No Ple shit. Pleasantville, yeah. It was all, it was all black. 
And they had houses. But yeah, I'm coming from New York. Yeah, I'm an apartment kid. So what? What? When did you start coming out to Houston? Oh shoot! When I was a kid, and I stayed with my grandmother. That's why I went to Fifth Ward. Mm. I came to Houston uh, by 1958. So I was starting seventh grade, and uh, my grandmother owned Mama Alice's Cafe at Greg and Orleans, Greg Street, mm -hmm. Orleans, yeah. where that new school is now. Yeah, that fire department. The fire department was across the street. It was a little small the fire department. Our house was right next door. We used to cook for the firemen because they walked walk right over the little, uh, the drainage thing. What do they used to call that shit? Sewer and shit? It wasn't a sewer, but it was like, oh shit, what do they call it? Because you just jump over it. It was like a like drainage. Like a ditch. Yeah, a ditch. Yeah. And they were right next door to us. We lived in the back. I had to get up in the morning, open the cafe. And the school was across the street, E.L. Smith. See, so what they've done, they cut off Orleans to build that school. And where I, we lived, you can't even tell. There were homes over there anymore. And and where the fire department is now, that used to be a field where the football field team and era would, would practice from uh, E.L. Smith. Yeah. That's crazy. You ready? Subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man. This is George Daniels from George's Music Room in Chicago, and you're watching Donnie Houston. Yeah, man, it's going down. It's Donnie Houston Podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. Um, we got a special guest, man, and I've said that before, but uh, when you talk about just black music, and specifically in Chicago. This man is an icon. Um, his store, George's Music Room, which is what you're sitting in right now, which is a, a, a dedication that we're here at Off the Record in Houston, Texas. Speakeasy, brand new speakeasy at uh, 416 Main Street downtown. Um, listen, man, this man has has done so much. I mean, his, his, his music industry uh, involvement goes back, you know, five decades at least so it's it's a true honor to have him here and i'm here with the man right now george daniels what's going Thank on you, man? man i'm glad to be here down here in h-town yeah 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 what's going on man been down here hanging out with, with my nephew and uh in this new place called off the record yeah. and i was just so honored that uh he thought that much of me that he wanted to create this room dedicated to uh george's music room yeah and uh, I guess it just shows the influence I had on him as he was growing up because uh, our family was pretty close-knit but spread apart across the country. Because uh, I wound up coming to Houston way before he was born, but staying with my grandmother. Wait, but you're originally from New York, right? Oh, yeah. I was born in the Bronx. Hmm. I'm like LL Cool J, born in the Bronx, raised in Queens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Uh, but well, my mom, who was a, a Guillory, Louisiana, mm -hmm. and uh, she met my dad. Uh, he was from Leesville, northern Louisiana, and she was from Opelousas. My, my dad's from from Opelousas area, so yeah. yeah so the, the Guillory family went mm -hmm. a pretty, pretty prominent family as far as you know uh, the demographics of the, the states and the cities that they come from, and. Uh, when uh, I was born, my mother worked up until the last half an hour before I was born in their first restaurant in the Bronx, New York. Hmm. And uh, by the time I was three or four, they had restaurants in Harlem and the Bronx. And uh, my two sisters, my brother, who was in the military, I didn't see him that much. He's my half-brothers because my mother married my father. It was a second marriage. And the craziest thing about it, I don't think I was... 12, 13 years old, before I realized we didn't have the same dad. <laughs> and their last name was Newsom, and mine was Daniels. But uh, it just shows uh, the love. And eventually, uh, mom and dad got divorced. And it was me and mother. She had a couple of the restaurants. And uh, I was home alone. But, man, I always had a job. I had paper routes and what have you. I was never into craziness. And in that era... It wasn't what it is today or like it is today. And uh, we moved from Queens to Jackson Heights. This is near LaGuardia Airport. And uh, 
This would be my second school. My first one was PS 154 in Queens. We moved to Jackson Heights and it was PS 143. And in New York, you go from kindergarten to sixth grade, you graduate just like here, mm -hmm. you go to junior high school. Well, I get to Jackson Heights and so my new school is PS 143 where I graduated from sixth grade. Graduated sixth grade and I'm getting ready to start junior high school and I start at PS 16. And uh, I get home, go and do my paper route, and then mother gets home. She, she say, you, you, you want to go to Texas, live with your grandma? I said, yeah. Hmm. I was shipped off to Houston. I didn't know anything about it. In New York City, going to public school. I went to school with white kids and the whole thing. Never, it never dawned on me about what was going on down south because we didn't see the media coverage wasn't with, with today as it was yesterday in those days. And so uh, I was excited to go to Houston. I get down there, man, I was so disappointed. I thought a stagecoach was going to pick me up. Because <clears throat> yeah, in Texas, I was watching the Cowboys on TV and stuff. Roy <laughs> Rogers, all, you know about Texas. I think I'm going to see Gene Autry and shit. You did. <laughs> and uh, I get down here, and my grandmother owned Mama Alice's Cafe in Fifth Ward on Greg and Orleans. And the school, E.O. Smith, was across the street. And my grandmother had the cafe. I used to have to get up in the morning, open the cafe with her, then go to school. And my first experience in understanding Southern education is how to be polite. Yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Well, I'm from New York City, and I'm coming here with yeah and no. <laughs> that didn't work. Corporal punishment, I was getting my butt whipped every day. <laughs> my grandmother had to come up and explain to them I wasn't from down, down south because that was my first experience going to school with all black kids. Hmm. And uh, But there was forms of, I guess, discrimination in New York too, but I, I was so young I, I, I didn't realize it until later on in life. Right here I have these three stitches in my finger, and uh, it was the craziest thing. After school, you get home and you take your school clothes off, put your play clothes on. And this is during a time where in Queens and what have you, there was a lot of swamp land and, you know, areas there. We lived in Parsons Gardens, like a development. Obviously, when I, I had looked back, it was for black folks. It was really nice. Actually, Billy Holiday lived across the hall from us. Hmm. But, of course, artists, just like when I came to Chicago, you sang, but you also had a day job. But on any event. Me and my friends, we met to go catch tadpoles, little frogs, right? And I fell, busting my finger open. And my friend, my white friend, he said, come on. And he, he takes me to his house. And he calls his mom, 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 because they live closer than I did. And she comes out, get that nigga out of here. Ooh. I thought we let something in. I didn't know what a nigga was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. You didn't hear those type of terms. You're looking for what is a nigga? What yeah, is I thought we let... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so my friend, I told him, I said, don't worry about it. I, look, I thought she mad at me because uh, let... you and come I, in, and you it did. was me that she didn't want in that house. I rushed home and my sister took me to Jamaica Hospital. So every time I look at my fan, remember these stitches. This is, I had to be nine, eight, nine, ten years old, if that old, when that happened. Wow. Then there was another time. Did you have to go home and, and, and talk about that with your parents? Like, I didn't you, know what it was. Know what it was. I, just, I, just, look, I wouldn't say nothing because I thought I did something wrong. Hmm. I let a nigga in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't about the white people. That, that's my friends. See, I never even realized across Parsons Boulevard. We lived in Parsons Garden, and they lived in another area. But it, we did, you know, it wasn't on the news and stuff like, like mm -hmm. it is today. It, it wasn't that type of media coverage. So, so much happens to black folks. Just think, if the same type of media coverage of yesterday was here today. It would be crazy. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And see, so back then, people got away with stuff. Police. Can you imagine how many black folks been murdered? But we see the few that, that it happens now which is too many, but that's... That was just what was happening. That's America. Yeah. Okay. Call it what it is. Yeah. Yeah.
So what? So around what years are these? When you when you going through all of this? What years? Fifty eight. Hmm. Fifty seven, fifty eight. Because I wound up in Houston, like I said, uh, starting seventh grade, hmm. and uh, my grandmother get, got ill. Then I wound up living with different relatives, my mother's sisters and brothers and what have you. That's how uh, Ellie's mom and uh, all my other cousins, their parents became my parents. Hmm. So in growing up, uh, I probably had about 12, 13 sets of parents. Hmm. So how do you end up getting to Chicago? Well, <clears throat> when uh, my grandmom got, got ill, and I was shifted around to different aunts and uncles. And then uh, my mother's youngest brother, Uncle Clarence from Philadelphia, he was in Houston. And uh, they were making arrangements for my grandmother to do whatever, because I was a kid, so I didn't know much. Next thing I know, I'm in the car with all my belongings, with my two cousins and my uncle heading to Philadelphia. Hmm. And that experience, driving through the South, I, I, I remember distinctly, you would stop and get gas, and, and you go to the colored bathroom, was on the railroad track, you, you outside. Oh, yeah. You had to be real careful. But I just remember him saying certain things, but, you know, you, if you had television in New York, now you had maybe five or six radio TV stations. In Texas, he said, shoot, there was like one. Then you hardly ever see the, the the only person that I used to see on TV, even in New York, on a regular basis, was Buckwheat, hmm. our gang, the first black person to ever have his own TV show. A syndicated, well, it wasn't even syndicated. They didn't even use that term back then, but his his own TV show, and it was fifteen minutes on every Monday. That was Nat King Cole. Hmm. The streets would be. We were one of the few families in Queens where we lived that had a TV. She should be empty for the 15 minutes to see Nat King Cole, who he's going to have. On so what is Nat King Cole? He's just singing or what is he doing? Yeah, Nat King Cole was a singer. I know yeah. that, but I'm saying his 15 minutes was just him it, just It was singing. a variety show, mm. singing. Mm. You know, I mean, the, some of the songs that, you know, just like we talk about uh, in Chicago, the house that uh, Michael built, Michael Jordan, the stadium. Mm -hmm. Well, that big round Capitol building, they always say it's the house that Nat built, mm. Nat King Cole. And I remember the stories, well, later on in life when when he had his family, Natalie was a little girl, and they wanted to move into Hancock Park, which is in L.A., and the fight them white folks put up to keep him from moving in there. And see, so it's, it's always been a pro process of them and us, or us and them. And, uh, well, you learn how to be a, you know, be diplomatic about it. But for me, the individual that I am is because of the way I was shifted. I don't have one lifelong friend, hmm. no one. I remember Georgie, Larry, Raphael, and Judy, my four friends from kindergarten to third, fourth grade, before I moved from Queens, Parsons Gardens. I wish I knew where they were today. Some of the only ones I remember it because then I come to Texas and a few, I don't remember any names from Houston because I wasn't here that long. Hmm. And so uh, I did one year in Houston. I finished seventh grade. Oh, all this shit happened in one year? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Not one year, but in, and when I came to Houston, I did one, I was here for one year. Yeah. Okay. When I left Houston and went to Philadelphia with my uncle, my brother called. My brother was in medical school to become a dentist, Dr. Max Newsom. My sisters and my brother, their last name was Newsom. And uh, it's a quick reference. You know the actress Paula Newsom? Yeah. That's our niece. That's my oh, wow. niece. That was my brother's youngest daughter. Hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I go from uh, Houston to Philadelphia, and he calls and hey, my family called me Danny. He said, hey, Danny, you want to come to Chicago? I said, yeah. I wanted to get away from my Uncle Clarence. So I was scared of him. He was pretty tough. So how long did you spend in, in, in Philly? It was a matter of weeks. Oh, no shit. I never did. You know, mm. It was just a pit stop. For mm. me, 
was like I was saying, through my life, I had so many sets of parents and so many different. So my personality is totally different from uh, any person that grows up and they just have one set of parents or grandparents or so on and so forth. So my thinking has always been different. And uh, I've always been a loner and I had to figure out a way to survive. And I guess that's why I smile so much. Because this dude's in school, man, something wrong with that dude. He always smiling. Mm. That was the only tool I had, mm. you know, to be accepted. I'm assuming, you know, I had to psychoanalyze myself uh, the way I made it through those years. So I get to Chicago. My brother's in medical school, and I'm starting eighth grade. And he sends me to the first time I went to a Catholic school, the eighth grade, on this, in the same neighborhood as the university, University of Illinois that he was going to in Chicago, on the west side of Chicago, near west side. And uh, graduated from eighth grade, and then I go to Farragut High School, which was, you know, because I had to make new friends in eighth grade, Chicago. Boom, I graduate, then I didn't go to the same school that they went to, so I go to a high school that nobody knew me, and I didn't know them. My first two years, my brother graduates from the University of Illinois Dental School, 1962. 3,000 medical school graduates at the McCormick Place in Chicago, the first McCormick Place to building. And six of those graduates were black, and one was my brother. Wow. This is 1962. He graduates. I go to New York to spend some of my mom. I come back, all of a sudden, we living on the south side now. and. Uh, I had to change schools again. So my second two years in high school was at a school on the south side, Chicago, called Hirsch High School. I had to create new friends there. Nobody knew me. And you know, all you know, you go to high school, you went from grammar school to high school with all your, your friends. I have none of them still to today. But that's how I had to survive as an individual. So I can say that uh Many of my experiences and that I achieved and I'm, I did well came from the independent. You always had to, had to network, I, quote unquote, did, and learn I, and meet people. The only people. person that, that knew about me that could help me was the dude in the mirror. Hmm. <laughs> and that's how I had to survive. And I've, I've analyzed it over the years, you know, and still today, I still have that same mentality. But I have so many friends from different backgrounds because I learned to get along with folks, you know? So, okay, you, you graduate high school and we were talking, you know, the war is going on. And you, you ended up going to college to not have to be drafted into. Yeah, to, avo to avoid the, uh, the draft, you know. I went to uh, Loop Junior College. And uh, this time, me and my girlfriend, who was a recording artist, Minnie Riverton. Uh, how, how do you meet R Minnie Riverton? Uh, the fall of 1964, when I graduated high school, I was hanging out and I meet her. We started liking one another. She had one more year at High Park High School in Chicago, and she worked at Chess Records as a receptionist, and she sang background. And uh, we started dating. And I was hanging around the studio. Next thing you know, they gave me a job cleaning up the studios at first. And then I became Edda James driver locally. And that's how, how, how was that, though? How was that being a driver? Well, it was fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, you didn't analyze things back then the way you do now. You know, I mean, people, well, you know, what's so and so like? How she like it? It's just a job for you, man. Hey, yeah. You do what you're supposed to do. You know, it's, it wasn't about. You know, if you had the type of personality to keep your job, fine. But the whole thing, it's the way things are analyzed today, it wasn't like that back then. Mm -hmm. You know, people honorable, man, look, my, my, my dad, my brother, what have you, they taught me how to shake a hand, how to look a man in his eye, you know, the values of being a human being, you know. And so that's, you know, that's the way it was. I mean, when you when, just think about it, just like here at the club, the music, I mean, to be exposed to the Count Basies and the Miles Davis and all, the music then 
you had a chance. I mean, to, to, to recognize who Beethoven and Mozart was as, as well as the blues and jazz and soul music. Okay? See, R&B was created by people at Billboard magazine, if you will. Because they didn't want to have a chart called soul music. Soul music, right. So they created rhythm and blues. So Billboard was I always wondered how did that change come? Because it wasn't even a change. We weren't included. Hmm. See, Billboard was about the charts, you know, for radio and sales. But, you know, the black charts were never that important. Didn't mean that much. Black people that worked at, at record labels. Their job was get the record plate on radio. So the record could be bought by by this chain operations and so on and so forth. Black folks, we didn't have radio stations all over America, but we had key key markets like Chicago with WVON. You know, Philly had it. I mean, when you when you break America down, and like from your generation, we talk about hip hop. When it started in New York, it had its own sound. East Coast. Then you go down to, to Miami when Luke came up with his thing. The base two live crew and so mm-hmm. Then Atlanta had his stuff. Chicago. You know, you Cleveland had, you know, bone thugs, but they, they, you know, they, they sound like a uh, uh, crucial conflict out of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And you had do or die. You know, common and the whole darn thing. You come down to Texas, Louisiana, Master P, what have you. You know, Rap a lot here in Houston. It's Swab House Records and so on and so forth. Then you get to the West Coast. You know, they, they, but Death nothing came between. Yeah, yeah. They, but ain't no hip hop come out of Arizona. Mm. I ain't never heard nobody from Nevada, <laughs> <laughs> Montana. You know, you hit L.A. and Oakland. You know, Oaktown three five two short and E forty exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. And you know, and at the beginning of their careers, they all, you know, they got a chance to have any type of hit. They came to Chicago. They had to visit George's Music Room. Hmm. And you know, and I made them feel like stars. Even man, I used to barbecue. We used to barbecue. I, there was a restaurant in Chicago called Edna's. I would always get the vegetables and stuff. Man, from Alicia Keys, everybody they they tell people, man, you could go. You better go to George's. He go hmm. feed you. And that comes from my experience being on the road with Billy Stewart. How how artists were treated. Not that we we didn't do any in stores, but I understood. The hard work and hold the appreciation and we're traveling in hotels and what have you type of food you don't never get no home cooking. Hmm. I give them home cooking at Georgia's. So okay, talk about this because you you started Georgia's. What was the idea to say I'm gonna start this record store? And you had what like a hundred dollars or something? Yeah, like that? It, well, it wasn't even an idea. It was I worked for a black man. His name was Jimmy Manette. Uh, I wound up working for him because I was working for my dad. That's me and Minnie split. My dad had restaurants in Chicago on 47th Street. So I worked for my dad. And uh, I don't know if we had a disagreement or something, because I remember one time, because even we had a couple of restaurants on 47th Street in Chicago. And I remember one time I, I wanted to do something. And I was telling dad, maybe he said, well, son, you know, when, when, when it's time for you to want to do your own thing, then you have to have your own business. I never forgot that. And so the opportunity came, an old employer of mine who was working for this man, Jimmy Minette. I stopped by there one day. That was that distributor, the 18th of Michigan, 17th of Michigan. And uh, I saw him and stuff, and I told him, I said, you know, me and my dad ain't been long. He said, well, stop by here on Monday. I had just bought my own car. Man, but $300, I was paying $50 a week hmm. <laughs> from Ben's Auto. What, what, kind, what, what kind of car was it? It was an old Pontiac convertible. Mm-hmm. That thing, man. But anyway, I rode down there, and he, he told me, he said, well, come back Monday, and I introduce you to the boss. I went back that Monday, and uh, they gave me a job. And that's when I used to pack records and hold on things because we were selling records to record stores. It'd be like Liam Bob's Cleaners and Records, Sonny's TV Repair and Records, and so on and so forth. And so... And then eventually, he wanted, he had a creative idea to, to create mobile one stops. In other words, put guys in cars with the music in the trunks. And I used to service these stores. At one point, 
I had so many accounts. I used to do close to $100,000 a month selling 45s mostly out of the trunk of my car because that's what we bought back in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, you bought an album, usually there'd be three or f two to three 45s that would come out before the whole album would come. And, you know, albums were selling for five ninety eight, six ninety eight back then. And uh, that's what I was doing. And I got good at it. And then these were the mom and pop stores, the husband and wives and so on and so forth. Fridays and Saturdays be busy. Next thing you know, I would get behind the counter and be helping them sell the records that I sold them. And uh, opportunity came. My boss uh, opened another outlet, and he put me in charge of this store. It was a one stop. And again, a one stop is a place where record stores go to where they can buy all the labels. That's why they call it a one stop because before. You'd have to go to Capitol Records, so and so and so and so. And uh, so then uh, he decided he wanted to close it. And I, and I went to the boss. I said, Well, can I get the story? He said, Well, go talk to the landlord. And that's how it happened. I convinced the landlord to give me 90 days credit on the rent. I brought my record player from home. I bought six albums, 145s. Hmm. December 12, 1969, I think it was. George's Music Room. I didn't even have a sign on the building. <laughs> hmm. So did people from your rapport that you gained from, you know, selling records for other people, did that help you have business or how was it like no, starting I, out? I was, I was just good at business. Again, hmm. growing up the way I did. I mean, being down here with my grandma, I'm at Mama Alice's Cafe, watching my parents with rest. I always had a job. I knew how to work. You know, that's the problem we have in today. People want jobs, but they don't know how to work. Mm -hmm. And see, so that's a cultural problem that we have, and I don't know how it's going to be corrected, but bottom line is I had that uh, ability. And then, you know, background with my dad, working in the restaurant, so on and so forth. So my mentality is always about customer service. I walk into any business, less like when we were over at the place or what have you. You know, I'll see how people are treated. Then I know the ownership. If you ever go into any business, a waitress or what have you, they don't treat you right. Don't blame them, blame the owner. Because hmm. that's who hired them. And see, and I always prided myself once my, my still really built. Because, you know, I got the one employee after about three years, I hired my first employee. A couple of years later, second, third, man, we, at like 1973, going 75, had me a Delta 88 convertible, brand new. Man, could tell me nothing, that <laughs> big old fro. You know, it was black exploitation movies back then. Then things are rolling. I hired that fourth employee. I wasn't shit. Hmm. I was only good to manage three. <laughs> I had to recognize my limitations. That's what I share with younger people all the time. Know your limitations. What, recognize them before you get knocked out. What was it about the fourth for that? that what what I just, differentiated the third I, I had the skills to manage three people. Hmm. It's like, you know, there are people that can, can bounce three basketballs. There's some that can bounce five. I can only bounce three. <laughs> Man. Yeah. So we're going through the 70s. I know you talk about, you know, the 90s was is what really turned you up. You mm -hmm. know, um, talk about because right now we're talking about soul music and, you know, the transition into the R&B and all that. But what was it about hip hop that really, you know, allowed you to, to, to grow and become what, you know, what you eventually became? Well, I'm not going to say what, what hip hop allowed me to do because it was still a genre. Because I was selling jazz and blues again. George's music room. It wasn't George's record shop. Everybody had a record shop. What made mine one? Because people said, why you call yours a music room? Duh, I sell music. Mm. <laughs> but it just happens to be, because when I started, there was eight tracks. 45s and albums. Then this thing called a cassette showed up. Then the compressed thing called a compact disc showed up. But I was still selling music. So my mentality, my whole attitude was totally different from people that own record shops. And most of them had variety stores. They sold candy and cigarettes and everything else. Not me. It was straight music. If you like Marvin Gaye, I had everything he made. Hmm. That can't go any of them. That's what I did. That's what made George's so special. Man, so, I mean... Who were, who were some of the earlier, you know, acts? You, just, you started getting these relationships, like you talk about the LL Cool J early in his career. Yeah, well, that, that came in the 90s. But mm. in between, uh, 
my first, the first time I had a visit from an artist, his name was Rocky Robbins, Robbie, Rocky Robbins. He was from Minneapolis. I forget the record he had. I think it was on A and M Records. The second uh, artist it was a, a dude, a Renee and Angela. Angela oh yeah, Bush. yeah. That was the second. I remember they came in the limo, parked in front of my. This is my first store, and I went and sat in the limo. With, I didn't want to leave Angela alone. <laughs> we laughed. We still laugh today about that. And uh, and so it, it it was a thing that my visibility really exploded in the nineties. I made bad decisions going into the 80s. I, I went through, and I'll be straight up on it, I, I had a 10-year uh, crack addiction. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It tore me down. Man. I lost two condominiums, a wife. Uh, I was, man. Did was, you get tired? Because, I mean, I, I hear a lot of, and I've spoken to people who got caught up in that. Was it a thing of, like, shit, it's just this new drug, and we don't necessarily recognize how dangerous it was. No, just, man, we had fun. I it's cheap. We get high. I, we, I didn't. No, let's see. Again, being a businessman. I used to, I, you know, every, besides the music, I did have a head shop, a corner where, you know, rolling papers, mm. some of the cocaine mix, the little bricks and what have you, and the marijuana pipes, you know? And uh, it was so funny. I came down here, Ellie was a, a little younger then, but when my mother lived here, and uh, my mother had a brain aneurysm, and she decided to have this surgery, my brother and my two sisters, nobody could come, but I came. I had just gotten married. This is 1979. And uh, I was moving my store to another store. And so my, my new wife and my assistant, they did all that while I was down here in Houston. And this is going to your second location. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. 3923. And so after, I was down here for maybe three or four months. I left, you know, left my business, look after my mom. I get back to Chicago, I'm operating a store, and one of my customers come in and say, hey, man, George, you gotta get the, you gotta get them cocaine pipes. I said, what are you talking about? I got pipes. He said, no, you gotta. And so I called my supplier, a company called Adam's Apple. And he said, oh, yeah, George, it's, it's called Freebase. Hmm. That's what it was before crack. Mm -hmm. And so I went and got the kits. They, they had manufactured kits. Oh, yeah, they had a bottle in there with ether. There's another bottle and a little plate in these glass pipes. And you should put your cocaine in the ether and shake it up and then pour it on a plate and the ether evaporate and what's left was free base. And this is before baking soda. And then one day, it was May, 1980. I guess, hey man, here's $50. Bring me something, let me see what this is. Biggest mistake I made. Hmm. One drag, that's all it took. What, what would you describe that feeling as to say, man, you know, you no. tried it that one time and, man, I'm out of there, man? No. It, it wasn't nothing. You sit down and, and analyze. Mm. <laughs> it just takes you. Mm. You know? And then when, you know, it, and it continues. Because once you hit it, then you want it, you want it. And that, that lasted, and, you know? So from 80 to 90? You, you yeah, 80 talking. to 89. 80 to 89, yeah. I lost cars. I had a 1949 Jaguar. I had a 69 Lincoln Continental. At a Delta 88 convertible, all gone. Two condominiums on the north side now. This is when, because just to give you a quick scenario, Chicago was the first market where condominiums started. Mm. That was 1973. And I bought two in 1976 on the north side. So so your store and the music business had allowed you to, to amass that type of well, well, yeah, well Or just other businesses you had going on? Well, it was a good cash flow, mm. okay? I mean... It seems like it was, a lot, it was a lot of money back then when I first moved in that building. I moved from the south side to the north side. The hottest TV show was the Jeffersons. Hmm. What was that thing? Moving on up. <laughs> That's just what I did. <laughs> I moved on up from 81st and Ellis to 1660 North LaSalle, right across the street from Lincoln Park. Boy, look. Hmm. I made it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, I blew it all. Were you yeah. were you were you still tending to your business or were you just kind of just I, lost? I was in Mud Harry. Look, I was very careless. Mm. Yeah. You know? Nothing was more important than hitting that pipe. Mm. How I was able to keep the stores and what have you. Yeah, it was, it was so crazy. I was I, I literally opened a, a second business even while I was addicted. Another record store down the street from my 
the original George's Music Room, and uh, I had moved to the west side, not far from the stores. Wait, um, an additional store in, in on top of George's Music Room? So you had multiple music stores at one yeah. time? Or well, just, you saying just different was, locations? It was George's Music Room, but a, a second location. Gotcha. I actually had a third location called Ears Records. Hmm. It was on the north side. It was in a white neighborhood. They didn't know I owned it. I had white employees. <laughs> In the midst of all this, in the midst of the addiction and all that. Yeah. Yep. No shit. So the business, you just made sure, like, I ain't going to lose this business. These cars and all the rest I, of this shit. I don't know if I, I said that to myself or not. Because, hmm. you know, to think back, to think, what was I thinking when I was getting high? You know? It's, uh, that's why I'm sympathetic with those that have addiction, with other folks that I don't understand why they do it. Well, nobody, get does, up. Well, nobody does anything to become addicted. If I knew, I mean, as a kid growing up in New York, when uh, my mom and dad would take me to Harlem where the restaurants were, and you see the, the heroin, heroin addicts, and all that. Because, well, you see the arms swollen up. You see all this. It's, man, I ain't we messing with that stuff. You see that image. You didn't see that image with cocaine. Hmm. You didn't see that image at all with crack. And then, just to give you another his historical point, it was free base at first. But then it flipped from that to crack. That's when baking soda came in. And it, was, and, it was, and it was cheaper. Well, no, it wasn't oh. any cheaper. Oh, yeah. so, so free base was still pretty much? It was the same thing, the same results. I know that, but I'm saying price-wise. Well, the crack, the term crack came because when you lit it, it cracked. It, it cracked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the baking soda. Hmm. See, when, you, when it was free base, it would melt down and it still had a smoke. But that's where it came from. Mm. Damn crack. So we we in the eighties. I mean, this is this is when hip hop starts coming around. When's your when's your introduction to that and kind of picking up and not looking at it as a fad like a lot of people were telling you like this ain't really gonna be you know. Yeah, no, it, it was. I, I never looked at it whether it's a fad or not. I always responded to my customers' desires. Mm. And see, so rap started in the late seventies and went into the eighties. Then it became hip hop. And so uh, it was just a transition in the music. And then, a, you know, a different lifestyle, different change, because you have to remember, not only was it the music, but it was the lifestyle. It was the way you dressed, all those different things. Look, Russell Simmons, Fat Farm, mm -hmm. and Nietzsche, mm -hmm. you know, all these brands. And, and then you had the role models. Carl and, and all that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, but Puffy said, he said, hey, if Russell Simmons is gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Sean John mm. came from that and so on and so forth. See, so hip hop, it was one of them things that became nothing but duplicating what somebody else did before. Mm. Then when it turned into beats, this is what we have now. This is one of the biggest problems we have with young people, whatever. They have no empathy for anything because everything they're selling to themselves now. There's no artist development, there's no nothing. I mean, when they start breaking hip hop in strip clubs, this is where your Nicki Minaj and them come from because Lil' Kim was the first one mm -hmm. with that image. You know, we grew up looking at, you know, Diana Ross and the Supremes and Martha and the Vandellas, all these females. And they, they got gowns on got, and all Exactly. Yeah. Because we went to hear them sing, not to look at their bodies. Mm -hmm. And see, this is flipped and it's turned into a sadistic type of a business now. Mm. You know? Women want the big asses and all this and that. And, and don't realize, man, time won't go so fast. That ass is just going to be these dudes with a lot of tattoos. Mm. But when they get my age, them tattoos, they're going to be the, <laughs> they are not going to look the same <laughs> mm. <laughs> when that skin starts sagging. But see, so it's a journey through life. And hip hop has created the worst movement that I call for immediate gratification. Mm. Mm. I want it now. I don't want to work for it. Yeah. Talk talk about uh Chicago hip hop though. Like are you seeing like a, a early no ID and comma and, and, and you know Oh they were, they were all at the store. Again, my influence, me going to all the places that I've gone to, meeting all these folks, I mean all the other see from Dougie Fresh and they they have stories about me hmm. that I didn't remember because they I was so outspoken. With all these black executives, they were the big wheelies in the business, you know. But they worked for the white man, hmm. 
And they, they would be up they 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 act so superior when happy. Because they would be working with radio personalities. And all they had to have was the bag to kick them down to play their records and so on and so forth. Uh but I also was the one that organized black stores and created an organization called NUIR, National United Independent Retailers. Hmm. I did that because they were calling us mom and pops. And I would get on these other retails, so I say, are you a mom and pop or are you an independent retailer? Hmm. And I said, well, act like it. They used to always bitch about all the stuff that I would get. But why do you think I got it? They didn't give it to you because they liked me. They got it to me because I produced. You know, when it was time for them to bring an artist, man, we made it an event. We, our customers were happy to come to Georgia's and you, see. And I would have two lines in front of my store: the line that you want to get an autograph in, and the line that you want to buy the CD. Hmm. Guess who got it first? The autograph line. No CD line. Who wanted to buy it? So okay, I'm, I'm thinking in the sense of like. You know, you come in, you get the autograph and the CD, and that no, was a, that well, was more see, of an exclusive that, type of thing. Well, yeah, hmm. but then you just let everybody in and see you people come and just want to, and you ain't gonna block somebody. So all, you, all you want is the autograph. Yeah, yeah, give me that money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you get this line. Hmm. If you want to buy the CD, then you hmm. get this line. Hmm. Again, guess who got it first? Yeah, yeah, the CD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, hmm. that's it. And see, so I set up that type of thing. I, you know, for me to go to from those different stores and wind up at in this burnt out church that the neighborhood, plumbers and carpenters, they all came to help me. They, I had a friend that kept the city inspectors away in the neighborhood. Hmm. They came and helped me build my store. And this, that, is, the, and this other, is the third location? This was so the fourth, what, no, this the fourth one. The, the famous one? The, the most, yeah, 3915. So when do you, what year do you move to that one? 89. Oh, man. I was just getting off of my addiction and hadn't that helped and and uh I pulled it off and then even the drug dealers and what that I got rid of all my paraphernalia, I stopped selling it. Not to just not, not attract not, that crowd. Not just to not attract that crowd. I did not want to be a part of getting other people addicted. Hmm. See, I, I was saving myself and then I had dudes in the neighborhood. They were like my guardians, man. If they saw any drug dealers, they would kick their ass. Don't you come in here and try to sell this shit to George. They protected me. That's a story in itself, man. The, the love that they, they showed me. And they, they watched me get kicked to the curb. Hmm. I mean, one of the evictions, <laughs> never forget it, uh, getting set out on the street and then it was getting ready to start raining and what have you. I was waiting for the man next door to get him so he was going to let me in. I had told him what was coming down. And this guy came up and he said, man, George, George gave it to I'll back my car up on the side where you put your stuff in the trunk before it, you know, it gets wet. Put my speakers and different things in there, what have you. Mr. Lucas, he showed up and we put stuff in there and this nigga got in his car and drove off with my shit. Yeah. He said, so, hey, but hey, got to get up and keep moving. But those are some of the memories that were just vivid you know but that's what people will do hmm. and uh it just so happened george michaels had just come out with that big hit record called faith mm -hmm. and i had the big stand that won't have you and i guess it got messed up in the rain but the word faith because it was uh uh like where you could tear it off and it was on the curb under some water just the word faith and i picked it up dried it off and i hung it in my office hmm. That was a message, man. Man. That was so deep. And I think I still have that, that piece of paper, the cardboard, like somewhere in my papers. But that was the thing, and I stuck it right up. And when we were building this store, I was literally sleeping in the store. And one day, because there was no windows and nothing there, and the guys that were helping, and there was a knock on the door. I went there, and this little Puerto Rican guy, his name was Alex. He said, uh, Reverend Scott from the church, a big church down the street. He said, I'm looking for George because he said I could help him. <coughs> I said, well, I'm George. He said, well, I, I build, I, I'm a carpenter. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he said, well, let me see what you, I said, well, I don't have much money. He said, let me see. He comes in the store and he asked me what I want. Because 
all the stuff I had was just strewn all over everywhere. And I gave him an idea. He said, we could do it. The way that show looked, you seen the pictures of it? Mm-hmm. That Puerto Rican did it. Damn. Man, I was, I was going to figure it out. You didn't even have no windows, you going, said. Huh? You said you didn't even have no windows in there. No. I mean, he, man, let me tell you. It was the most amazing thing. I still had my convertible at that time. And we were going to the lumber yards. I was picking up used lumber. I even broke a bone in my hand during that time. And I was in the yard pulling out the nails out of the used lumber. I didn't even think about the floor because the floor was really screwed up. But he leveled the floor off, the whole darn thing. And, and I told him what type of showcases I wanted. All of that was custom built. He built it all. Then we went and picked up the glass, the, the, the frames, all this, and he did the front. Alex, that is amazing. He's man. passed since, but uh, I never forget him. I got pictures of him and the work when we were in that store. It was, uh, <laughs> I mean, and the, the people in the community were cheering the dudes from the pool room and what have you. They were, they were my cheerleaders, man. Mm. And that's when, in that yard, because the yard was just glass and gravel and what have you. And then one of my customers is, I remember, I remember you get Larry, Larry Smith. He come out and said, George, why don't you let me put you a, a lawn and stuff out there? And I said, well, how much is that going to cost? He told me, I said, well, let's try it. And he created that right there, middle of the hood. Boy, I had, it looked like a golf putting lawn. It was so beautiful. And that's where we did that's the That's where you did the cooking and all that. Yeah. That is crazy. I mean, we did the events, and when we would do in the summer, we'd have to do the in stores. People would go in the store and buy the CD and come out in the yard and get it autographed. Because I'd have a big canopy to have them in those king or queen chairs and Queen Latifah. I know the one time with Queen, it was the funniest thing. A year before, remember that uh, thing that Bishop Juan came out with, the pimps up hose down? Yeah. I had Queen Latifah in there, and then the yard. Because the building has since burnt down that was next to me and what have you. So people would pull up in there and park. And so we up there with the Lion Queen. And sound I said, hey, you, you got some fans coming. And she looked over there. You mean those are real people? <laughs> <laughs> Bishop, <laughs> Minister, Seymour, they get out the green and gold Cadillac. Yeah. And hey, Queen, I tell you, I know she, she didn't realize it was a true story. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> that was the funniest thing. Yeah, yeah. But then I had Puffy out there. I mean, we we did it with a lot of the stars. I mean. Phew. And this came from reputation or this came from you going out and hitting the pavement and building these relationships it, it, it with people came, and they come in and say, okay, when well, we come to Chicago, we come to. Well, it came from me and my relationship with the record labels hmm. because I made them, those executives look good. Hmm. See, nobody could do an install like George's. Hmm. And uh, I saw mistakes made by other store owners, not that it was as popular as I made black retail. But I remember uh, Stephanie Mills was doing this in-store in Jamaica, Long Island. And I was there, but I saw it in the media and what have you. It was, un- it was an organized, it got unruly. The crowd destroyed the goddamn store, broke the windows out, all kinds of shit, because there was no order. Mm-hmm. And so right away, then this before I started doing the big events, well, before I was able to do them, but I had a philosophy of, I put order in place before this order takes place. Mm. And that's the way all of my in-stores were. And that's why the record companies, labels, the execs, I made them all look good because the media would be there. The hottest radio station at the time was WGCI, Elroy Smith, the program director. And uh, he talked to me, and I let them put their own phone line in my store. Mm. So they can, they can come and broadcast anytime they want to. Whenever I'd open up at 4 in the morning for the morning show. I did stuff like that. And see, so. And this is all coming from you. This is your mind just yeah. saying, man, how can I really take well, this thing to the max? Exactly. And see, so what I added to retail was the show business. Hmm. Yeah, Are they the performing record. when they come to these in stores? Oh, they just sometimes. Hmm. Oh, no, man, look. Remember when they first came out with that flatbed stage mm-hmm. that they could drive with them? Mm-hmm. First time they ever used it in Chicago, DMX performed right on the side of my store. No shit. Now, we used to shut the whole, and see, Roosevelt Road was a big main thoroughfare. We just shut it down, man. And the kids in the neighborhood, look, I love my community, and this is something I learned from my dad. See, because those are your first, when I first started George's, 
all of my customers lived in the neighborhood. They walked to the store. Nobody was driving to Georgia. <laughs> See, it wasn't that special. It was a record shop. And so as time had gone on, and then as I start recognizing what I had to do, and when I started going to the convention, like I said, Dougie Fresh and all up, and they, they got stories of remembering me when I used to jump in them executives' asses hmm. at the little panel discussions or what have you. And they were talking down, I said, wait a minute. I said, you have a job, right? They said, yeah. I said, well, we own our own shit. Hmm. I said, so don't talk down to me because you got an employer. Hmm. I'm my own boss. And you need me more than I need your ass. Oh, you was on them like that? Yeah, because, that, that, you know, educated black men and old women, they had superior attitudes. Not all of them, but there were some that were arrogant. But the bottom line is, your job is to get records played and sold. And your job is to do that to black store owners. They don't have your black ass going to white stores because hmm. they got white folks for them. If your black record became a hit. You got to come see me. Then they give it to the white guy to hmm. take it to the white station. Hmm. The black dudes couldn't take it to the white station. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's why they called the black music division. And the pop music division. It was something I was seeing you saying too, though, how they wasn't really playing fair with y'all, though. How like a white store, somebody might get some money for certain types oh, of things yeah, well, going we didn't on. Oh yeah, we didn't know. But then I, I re it was just so funny yesterday when uh, when Leslie took me to Fifth Ward. One of the guys that had he had a record had a record store, and he boy he sold me. He said he said man, it's it's because of me. And I taught, I taught black stores how to get the marketing dollars that we never knew. You come do a display in my store, I, I thank you. Oh, yeah. I didn't know I was supposed to get paid hmm. until I joined NARM, the white organization, National Association of Recording Merchandisers. And one of those guys from the, the, the days of Clarence Avon, he introduced me to that organization two years after I started business. And that's where you learn the marketing. It was called a NARM Retail Certification Program. It was just seven days, 12 hours a day at the University of Chicago. And I came out of there, man, I knew how to, I knew what they did. Hmm. It's just like Tower Records. They have all those windows. You want a window of Tower? 25,000 a month. So if you got 10 windows, that's a quarter million dollars a month. And y'all was just missing all that money. I wasn't missing it. We, we just didn't know, didn't we know you were supposed to get right, 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 right. But, you know, you just didn't get it because it was dead. You had to earn it. You know, what kind of location you have that they would want to pay? Yeah. You just put another thing. But I went and bought light boxes. Hmm. And so they would send their, their transparencies that I put in the light boxes. Me three, four, five hundred dollars a month for a light box. Hmm. And then, you know, I got 10, 15, 20 light boxes. Because yeah, that's supplementing my income. Huh? And the record selling, because you're talking about this is when you had to go to the store and buy physically the, buy, buy the record, yeah. And then like Halloween or what have you, I never gave out candy, but I swear I wish I kept them posters. I used to have posters rolled up because we used to get tons of posters, and that's what I would give the kids for Halloween. Because I never want nobody coming back say I poisoned the kids or hmm. something. You did, but that's what I used to do. Talk about some of the some of the artists. I've heard you say uh, like like an early Mary J. Blige and like who are some of the people you remember that really came out to go on and be like these stars that you that you can say I saw this person at this level oh, in their God. career. And they mean, went on to look, be like Alicia major. Keys, hmm. Destiny's Child. I mean they 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 came to my show with the original four. Hmm. Right? I mean uh, Jermaine Dupri, the brat. Uh, I mean shoot, the list goes on. I mean look over here to remember. <laughs> And then that, that picture there, that's Hewitt Abner, that's uh, Barry Gordy, Gerald Busby, and George Clinton. Hmm. We were at the BRE convention. We all got an award that night, the same award. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Did you t t talk about, um, you know, because R. Kelly, he shouted you out on the record. Yeah. And, yeah. You was, and you were in the Contagious video. Uh, exactly. Actually, I was the one that got it. Uh, Isley Brothers, that song, because Gerald Busby, 
God rest his soul. That's the guy that's in the picture next to George Clinton. Mm -hmm. Gerald Busby is the one that Barry Gordy gave the keys to, to run Motown. And he became, but then years later, he wound up at DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't in on the negotiation. I didn't know nothing about it other than uh, Gerald called me and said, George, we paid R. Kelly like 125000 for a song. He said, but it ain't a hit, man. He said, he said can you go talk to him? And you, know, you have to give us a better song than this. And so I went and talked to Rob. And I told him, you know, he's friends of mine. You got to, boom. That's where he got Contagious. So you set up the Contagious record. I influenced R. Kelly to give my friend Gerald Busby, who was, you know, uh, Isaac Brothers was on the label for DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. And and that's what he he gave him the uh, Contagious song. Okay, how do, how early does your does your relationship go with R. Kelly? Because I hear a lot of stories about him putting in work around Chicago and being like a street singer and doing all these oh, things. Oh yeah, now. no, he used to play in the subways and all that. Hmm. No, he yeah. yeah, he went to Kenwood High School, what have you? And uh, he was just like all the other. It's like do or die. Hmm. The rap group, what have you? Hmm. They were kids coming to my store. They lived in the neighborhood not far from my store. Crucial conflict, hmm. same thing. I just saw them a few weeks ago, but I see them all the time. They were the kids in the common. Game. His first insult was with me. He was a little small little guy. Yeah. I mean, Bow Wow did, shot his video around. The, the, the thank store. you video you was talking about the other night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Shauna. Yeah, Shauna. Yeah, yeah, DTP. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but look at one of her videos. It, there were so many scenes, right? They shot it at night in front of my store with the lights on and stuff. Yeah. yeah see, so uh, I was in her, I was in two or three of her videos. I was in a Cash Money video. Uh, Which cash money video we got? I don't remember. I have to look at my. Okay, tell me. Let's look. go back to Contagious. Because mm -hmm. I used to always wonder, okay, I know Ernie Asley, but who was his first dude coming in there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was like, he bought some business, man. Like, oh, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, they just told me, but, yeah, that's what they wanted. At mm -hmm. least they said to walk in, and I'd, I'd, I'd put that image and stuff on there. But, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I still got that suit too. <laughs> oh shit! In the hat, but uh, yeah, that was fun. Then I was in the uh, Kelly Price, the friend of mine video. Mm -hmm. That was fun making that one, and uh, I've been in a bunch of them, man. And so people would just call you up, hey George, man, I want you to come down. They want me to be in the video. I said, well, you know, George's music room became pretty popular, and uh, when when did you know? Okay, this is something. It wasn't about knowing. Hmm. I, I, it wasn't a plan. It wasn't, you know. I mean, not plan, but I'm saying, when did, when, did you ever recognize? Because it's a lot of things, like there's certain things I've done, and I always tell people, like, when you're really doing the work and you got your head down and you mm -hmm. just focus on the work, you don't really understand what's the multitude of the, how how much is really going on because exactly. you're so focused on the work. Yeah, Is it well, that type of thing? Well, it's an individual thing. Hmm. You know, I mean, look at the tens of thousands of people that have record stores. Hmm. Why didn't they do what I did? Hmm. You know? I just recognized that music was part of entertainment. Hmm. Why shouldn't people be able to shop and be entertained? Why shouldn't they have a nice place to look at with the posters, the whole thing? You come off the street and you're coming into entertainment. That's what I wanted George to be like. And so I had a chance to build that with that store, hmm. with that Puerto Rican. And he made it glamorous. Hmm. And then we were able to do it with the displays and then with the knowledge I learned from Norm, and eventually, I wound up being the first person of color to ever be on the board in arm. I served two, three-year terms from hmm. 1993 to uh, 96 and 99 to 99. Two, three-year terms on it. Damn. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I was associated with, like Tower Records. Me and Russ Solomon were the best of friends. Hmm. He's the founder of Tower Records that started in Sacramento. Can uh, you? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Hmm. Talk talk about the the, the rap a lot connection. Oh, because you had the Fifth Ward Boys hat on right now, so exactly. you can't ignore. I that. got that yesterday. They they they, boy, they they gave me some gear. I'm telling you. Hmm. And so uh, Dewey and Spook, I saw they all had you on Instagram. Yeah, right they were so excited to see me because Leslie he surprised them when you know bringing me by there. But uh, it was it was just uh, my store was the perfect fit, you know, for what they were doing, and. Uh, at the time, I'm rebuilding, you know? And uh, I was just open to it. I had the space to do. See, most stores didn't have the type of space I had. Hmm. Whether we did it outside, because I had the lots on both sides. 
I mean, uh, uh, what was that movie that Ice Cube did uh, with Lisa Ray? Oh, man, he had he did the soundtrack. Rock, R. Kelly had a song in it too. Oh, I forget that movie. Players Club. There it is. Mm -hmm. We did a big event. I had a big tent right there on the side and what have you. And I mean, we we just when uh, Destiny's Child came, we we had them outside on the podium, sitting at the table meeting. Uh, Ron Isley actually performed Contagious in the yard. No shit. And he was so shocked because it had just come out. He came for the in store, and we man, I had the sound systems out there, the whole thing. And, and he's out there singing his song, and the, the, all these young people knew the lyrics. <laughs> and he said, "God, they know my song." Like that. Man, that's that's that that contagious. It's it's crazy hearing you say this. Mm -hmm. my, me and my little sister to this day, we will still go back and forth with the multiple parts and yeah. like the way he did. Well, see, R. Kelly was such a genius because literally, if you really check it out, it was an opera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before yeah. he was doing the trapped in the closets and all that, he was setting up these scenarios. Was, and yeah. This is how creative. He, I mean, he had thousands of songs and what have you, but where they came because he didn't write. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever spend time in the studio with him when he was? All the time. I mean, mm -hmm. then late at night, shit, three, four in the morning and stuff like that. Is there any studio session that stands out where you say, "Man, no. I'll never forget he he did this particular not, song"? And not really. Hmm. No. It was, this was just regular stuff. Just yeah. He'd always he'd love for me to be around and stuff, you know. <coughs> and then uh, when 9-11 hit, and uh, he was the only American artist in Europe at the time. He had just gotten there a few days before 9-11. And uh, he took the Queen Mary and the crew over there, the boat, because he wasn't flying. I, don't, I believe I, I didn't fly. He didn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, all this shit was going down. And I get a call from Barry Weiss, the president of the Giant Records. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, Barry, what's up with you? He said, look, I need you to do me a favor. I said, what? He said, well, you know Rob is in Europe and what have you. He's the only American artist there. And he wants to come home, but he needs to stay there and do that tour. I said, okay, what do you, what do you want me to do? He said, well, everybody knows he listens to you and what have you. And we want to send you over there to convince him to stay. So me and my wife got on the plane about two weeks after 9-11. Man, we were the only ones on the goddamn plane. Flew to Dusseldorf, Germany. Meet him there, they'd be surprised on the show at the hotel. And the whole crew, they all tripped out when we walked in. And then Rob was out shopping. He came back and he saw us. said, oh man, he was really tripping. And he said, come on, man, let's talk. And he, he wasn't talking. And so I sat him down and I was telling him about how important it was for the image of America and for him it would be great, you know, to represent the United States here because you're the only artist in, in Europe and to continue your tour. You know, you look good. And uh, he told me, he said, okay, I'll do it under one condition. That's what I said. He said, you got to stay here with me. And hmm. uh, that was the greatest time, man. The tour bus to go all over Europe. I mean, it's like going back to grammar school hmm. and the, the White Cliffs of Dover and all of that to literally see them, you know. But, yeah. And that's uh, that was an amazing time, man. And we had tour buses: Germany, France, Belgium, Switzerland, England. Yeah. Were there any other artists that you had that power of influence over? Or well, he was just one of the ones. He was, was a Chicago one, guy. But, you know, I could, I could get a conversation with any and everybody, but we we become very close. Hmm. Yeah, he's a Chicago kid. Yeah. Talk about uh, you talk about nine eleven and. I think I heard you say one time that that change, that was the beginning of changing like the retail game. Oh yeah, oh, but everything changed behind that, but uh, what really changed the retail game was Napster. Hmm. And when Napster hit, when uh, these white stores, boy, they were tripping in it. And I was on the board of Norm, so I was hearing them because you know college kids, they would just put their laptop on and the computers and go to bed and they download all this stuff on music. A friend of mine, Crow's Nest, this bike would open up this big ass ten thousand square foot store under the dormitory on the campus of DePaul University. Just when Napster hit. Ten thousand square feet. He didn't last a year and a half. Because dude, they wasn't buying no music when they get it for free. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened there. It was it was it was devastating. Napster and then 
for black retail, they, they came after us with the lawyers because of us selling mixtapes. Mm -hmm. And then I called them. I said, because they said, I got papers. I said, yeah, I'm on the board. What the hell are y'all doing? And, and then all of a sudden, because I raised so much hell, they backed off of messing with the black retailers like that. You know, because like, like from DJ Drama and all of them, we sound hell. Oh, so you just transferred to, okay, well, shit, I'm just going to get the mixtapes and just. No, no. I wasn't just, it, was a, it was about what customers wanted. Hmm. And the game was changing. But mix mixtapes also exposed artists. It was a marketing tool that the record labels didn't have to pay for. You know, you giving enough free promos out. This is a way to expose the product and expose your new artists. Mm. Yeah. Man, so what? When when did you finally say, you know what, I'm I'm bowing out? No, I, I didn't bow out. I was forced out like everybody else. I mean. Hmm. The digital age. Hmm. I mean, now it's really got a point. There was no... See, now all these youngsters have their communication here. They don't decorate their rooms with posters anymore where you get posters. No physical product. Nobody want to read the credits and all I used to have I used to have frames that sell that, that you could frame your albums hmm. and put on the wall. Because this is a, a relationship. The artwork on the album covers was amazing. I mean, certain record labels, and they had these artists, uh, the jazz label, CTI, and what have you, the jazz stuff with Donald Byrd and so on. I mean, but this was your relationship you built with the artist. This is your investment. And man, look, I used to love for them to give me those posters. We, of course, we get the store decorated stuff, but then as an extra added bonus to give a poster to a customer when they bought the album. So what what year would you say when it finally was just like man you know what this well it, well for me I I think I finally closed up with 2017 18 oh well shit I mean you still that's that's all right we're in still though well, yeah well mm -hmm. but, you know what it was 2001 that Mayor Daly gave me the opportunity mm -hmm. actually it was 2000 and I opened up 2001 three months before 9 11 I opened up George's Music Room at Midway Airport mm -hmm. I was in the airport for 17 years. Because of Mayor Daly. He gave me the opportunity. He visited my store when I was celebrating 30 years in business. Not a big hoopla and what have you. My alderman, he came and said, look, the mayor is doing a, a march down Roosevelt Road, and he wants to stop here and you know do a news conference in front of your store. He said, I said, oh, that's fine. And uh, sure enough, you know, we could see the parade coming down early that morning to City Hall. They brought his podium down, the City Hall podium, put it in front of the store. He did the news conference doing it, and then he said, hey, where's George? And I was standing like to his rear left. I said, I'm right here. He said, come here. And so they presented me with a plaque for my 30 years in business. And then he said a few words. I said a few words. He said, come on, show me your store. We go inside. He looks around. He said, look, I got an idea for you. I said, okay, Your Honor. Same thing, nothing of it. It was three or four months later, I get a phone call from City Hall. Hmm. May is, May is having a meeting. He wants you to come down. I said, "What time?" They said, "One o'clock." I was down there at eleven thirty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mister Listen, dear yeah, boy. So I go up to fifth floor, city hall, and they say, "Hey, Mister Daniels, have a seat." I was sitting. I was like, well, "Where's everybody else at?" You know, think it's a meet. One o'clock, straight up. Mayor Daly walks out the door. He says, "Hey, George, come on back." Me and him kicked it for four hours. Hmm. And near the end, he said, "Look." Tell me what you want, and I'll tell you what I want. I said, well, Your Honor, I hadn't thought about anything. He said, well, you know I'm, I'm rebuilding Midway Airport. I said, yeah. And he said, and uh, I'd, like you to have, I'd, I'd like you to put George's music room in my airport. Hmm. He said, can you do it? I said, yeah. I said, pretty sure I can. That's how I got in Midway Airport, him, him alone. I wasn't beholden and no black politician, none of, none of that. It was him. And boy, both of us, we had fun with it because once I got it open, because my store was sharp, man. Mm. And then the black bank, I borrowed the money from them. And in return, he held a news conference at the bank and put some city money in that bank for them loaning me the money to build that store out. That's and crazy, then, man. Then it's all these events, special events and what have you, his people would call and say, the mayor would like you to attend. And so, so I'd go down and I'd be in the receiving line. They'd always have me the last one. So then I'd walk in with the mayor. 
these big M so cool and he used to, he used to really mess with this black or all of it. He comes to the table and he's still like, he said, Yo, y'all don't know George? <laughs> oh God. I saw him a few months ago at the HBC Classic in Chicago. And we laughed. I was so glad to see him. But uh yeah, that was uh Man, you, you had an, an, an incredible life, you know what I mean? Like, I, I was telling Elliot, I said, man, I want to be as cool as your uncle <laughs> when I get that age, man. Like, what is what is the key to, to that type of life, man? Well, again, just like I was telling you, I've been such an individual and the exposure to folks and, like, the way my, my dad conducted himself coming up and, you know, living with my brother and then all these other examples, his grandfather... Man, look, my uncle Calvin, boy, I'm telling you, shoot, that was that was man. I come from New York as a kid. Mm. I learned how to crab and, and hunt and stuff because of my uncle Calvin, man. Mm. And so I had so many male role models, and so I'm I'm a piece of everybody. All my uncles and I come down here because you know our parents, you know, it was five girls and five boys in the Guillory family, and. Uh, Everybody had a personality. Then I wind up, you know, with my brother, and then that's, you know, I see an academic, if you will, because of what he had to do to become a dentist, and to see the work he had to put in, because we lived in an old tenement that was owned by the University of Illinois. You know, I came to live with him, and uh, to see what he had to do to become a, a dentist, yeah. and so that there, there were just so many things. It's, it's just like when you make a great gumbo. Hmm. You got a lot of shit going in that gumbo. Hmm. Well, that's who I am. And so I can't say one particular person that I emulated because I emulated so many. Yeah? Hmm. And so uh, I, just, I owe it to family and just exposure. Yeah? It's, uh, it ain't like, well, how did you know when was that? Well, things happen. And, you know, you, you play your cards right. I guess it comes out right. And, but then, again, through this story I'm telling you, you've heard the ups and the downs. And see, so, like my father said, son, you don't make it through life, you're going to get knocked down. Just don't get knocked the fuck out. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. And that's what I've lived by. Hmm. I've been knocked down many times, but I never got knocked out. Just keep on going. You got to. Hmm. You got to. Let me, let me ask you something. I'm going to close out. You can only take five artists with you. Mm-hmm. For the rest of your life, what five you take? Lou Rawls, Nancy Wilson, Bobby Bland, uh, probably Aretha Franklin, James Brown. Because hmm. they're all different types, different categories. Of, I mean, I could, you know, I could throw Mahalia Jackson in there. And, See, because the whole thing about music today, again, is about beats. <laughs> it has no lyrical content that makes sense. You need a 10-year-old to interpret this crap for you, and they're not telling you nothing. But, you know, back in the day, Smokey Robinson sang a song in those days. Records were two minutes, 30 seconds long. And those, those little songs will teach you how to speak to a girl, how to apologize. Hmm. You, you know, you learn how to apologize. You had jazz. You know, instrumentals that you could read a book by and listen to it. You know, I mean, you know, again, like from the classical music, you know. There was just so much exposure and and it's so it's changed so much and so the brain is not being totally utilized for these, these youngsters and you know, when uh government should Have a parents that want to be like love and hip hop. Hmm. They want to be like Nicki Minaj and all these others and what have you, just because of the material items, but, but no, no style, no class, no originality. Yeah, originality. Well, no respect. Hmm. Okay. I mean, our children, you don't see them smile. When the last time, when the babies don't laugh, hmm. and then you see these youngsters, eleven, twelve, fifteen. Got an attitude. 
you know, you just see that. Then you, you say, what's true? And they go cut snap at you. That comes from just now. It's it's with all of them. Uh, in Chicago, when Rahm Emanuel became the mayor, and I've challenged a bunch of those, all the been people wondering, what, what, you know, what went wrong? I told them, I said, the, one of the worst things that he ever did. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, oh, y'all don't know? And I confronted all of them. When he became mayor, the first thing he did, they locked up all the chiefs hmm. of all the gangs. Larry Hoover's people and all, and locked them all up. When that shit happened, then you wound up with a, three or four gangs in the same block because them chiefs had people in Ain't no leadership. It was yeah. cool. I mean, they, look, the chiefs, the commanders of the police district knew who the chiefs were. If somebody did something, you heard a senior citizen, do that commander will call. And that chief gonna give him up because y'all will talk better. And when that happened, man, look, that's what we have now. Mm. Last year we had over 1,800 carjackings in Chicago. Average age, 12 to 17. Come on, man. Look at the video games. What's the most popular game? Grand Theft Auto. Auto. Mm -hmm. All these violent gangs. And who's doing the shooting now? I mean, but you don't hear nothing from from the gun in industry, the weapons industry, they quiet as hell. But all you got to do is, is, is do some research and see what politicians they donated to and then look at how they vote. It's all about, you know, they put us, you know, pray to God, Jesus will fix it. You know, prayer, prayer, prayer. Come on, man. It's these politicians that have created conditions we're in, period. I mean, when I look back at the first coming to Texas, I we go to the movies. We had to go in the balcony and stuff. I wasn't used to that because I was from New York. But that didn't make New York no better. This is supposed to be America. It's just like this governor y'all got here sending these Mexicans every day, and we're in Chicago. We catch it hell because how can one governor can drop all of that on other states? But this is what's going on. It's bad, man. It's bad, and. There's no music talking about it. James Brown, shit. Back like during the civil rights movement, said mm -hmm. loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Mm -hmm. Look at the song, Marvin Gaye. What's, What's going, going on? on? Yeah, yeah. And you could play that song today and it's still, still a Still real, yeah, yeah. Where's that music? Where's the songs about the uh, uh, pandemic? Mm -hmm. Where's the love? You know, where's it? It's yeah. a shame, man. It's yeah. the same. You know, and just like I named those artists, these are people, if you sound like somebody else, just 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 think about it. All those artists, Aretha Franklin, James Brown, Gladys like the groups, not one of them sounded like, not one, because it wasn't allowed. There's a bunch of them that would sound just like it, but you know what? Radio wouldn't play you. Look at the diversity we had in music, from blues to gospel to jazz. I mean, a dude playing saxophone. But I can tell the difference between Jimmy McGriff or Jack McDuff or John Coltrane and Sonny Stitt. And so they had a sound that, and they playing the same instrument. Mm -hmm. Where is that at today? Everybody looks alike, they dress alike. <laughs> yeah, the originality is gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. You know, because what's new is it's a beat, and but all of them, if, when you go to these clubs, it's that same one beat. I don't care what else is going on, but it's that same one thing. Mm -hmm. Algorithm. As a, as a DJ, I don't, I don't enjoy playing new music because everything is pretty much the same BPM, same well, it's, type. Well, because it's not music. Mm -hmm. It's beats. Okay, There's a difference. Like young guy, I said, man, George, I'm in the music business. I make beats. Well, don't talk to me because mm. I ain't interested. And there's small little, you know, pockets of musicians that are really living up to the, the you know, the, the, the essence and the truth of, of, of our history, mm -hmm. of the legacy of our music that shouldn't die. You know, but they were the storytellers years ago, the minstrels that told the stories. That's what this is supposed to be. Now all these little niggas is studio gangsters. That's what we used to call them. Mm -hmm. Rapping all that tough stuff and what have you couldn't do. Buzz a great. Now they rap about it, they'll pull a gun on you. 
All the lyrics they in, they solve a problem. Shoot. They don't know. It's not their fault. All they want to do is get the money. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Well, man, um, you got anything before we close up? I'm good. Man, I appreciate you giving giving me this time, man. This this has been an honor. You know, um, I was telling Elliot before we started, I said, man, this is one of them ones I'm really looking forward to. You know what I'm saying? So I, I appreciate you, man. Oh, thank you, man. I hope you got enough stuff to chop up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most mm-hmm. definitely. We can do part two next time. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's, oh, man. Let's do it. Well, hey, man, it's the Daniel's Podcast, the icon, Mr. George Daniels. It's the Daniel's Podcast. I'm Donnie Houston. We up out of here. Oh, yeah. Danny Houston. Subscribe to the Danny Houston podcast, man.